Hello, welcome uh, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us in this, uh, in this event, webinar and presentation of, of, a, of a great book that the Austrian Economic Center and the, and the Fundación Bases have recently published. My name is Federico Fernandez. I am senior fellow, a senior fellow at the Austrian Economic Center. And I'm also president at Fundación Internacional Bases in, in Argentina. I am here with uh, Adrián Rabier and Georgiana Constantin Park. I will introduce them properly in, in, in a few minutes. But firstly, just make, uh, let me make a, a couple of, of remarks of this event, of, of why this event, what, what are we doing here, and, and, and what's this book, how, how this book came to life. Firstly, I want to thank the, our, our partners, the, um, the groups that helped us promote and, um, and you know, make some publicity to, to get as many people involved in this, in this uh, webinar. The partners of this, of this webinar are ESEADE, the Capitalism Center for ESEADE from Argentina, the Capitalism Center from Poland, the Hayek Institute of Romania, the Mises Institute of Poland, the Freedom and Entrepreneurship Foundation, which is in Poland, but is also an international group, Liberty International, Fundación Liberar from Argentina, and Club de la Libertad eh, from Argentina as well. Thanks to all of them for, for, for helping us promote this, this webinar. The book that we are going to present, it's a, it's a very big book, has lots of contributions, and it comes from a conference that happened in, the, in, in November, um, or October, sorry, of 2019 in Vienna. It was a, the eighth international conference, the Austrian School of Economics in the 21st century. And we were very happy to host that event because it, it was in a way our contribution to make uh, Austrian economics uh, come, you know, come back to, to, to Vienna, to the place where it all began, the place where our school of thought was, was born. It was a great effort. It, it wouldn't have. It, it would not have been possible without the, all the help and everything that the Austrian uh, Economic Center of Vienna did to have the event there. The, the event was born in Argentina in 2006. It was originally an event that took place every two years, always in in Rosario, which is Argentina's second city, probably. Um, and it was our intention to, given that the conference was born in this two-year uh, gap, with this two-year gap every two years, in the in the year, you know, in the in the middle year, to to be able to make it in in Vienna, and and we could uh, we could let's say convince our friends from the Austrian Center to to do so. Uh, I always say, almost as a joke, that. I was trying to convince Barbara for five years and finally, <laughs> finally I did and, and, and we could have it and, and it was a great event. And this book that we are going to present in a way testifies what, what a great and amazing event we could organize in 2019 in, in Vienna. We had great uh, keynote speakers, great panels, great, great you know, presentations by many of our, of our speakers. As I always say, and sorry if you heard me say this in the past, but it, you know, it, it must be remarked, as organizers, you know, the Austrian Economic Center, the Hayek Institute, Fundación Bases, we try to create the best framework we can for the conference, but the real heart of the conference, the real soul of the conference, are the speakers and, and the people who attend and the audience. And for that, we are extremely grateful and humbled for the amazing support that we had. We had more than 50 speakers during two days in Vienna, and we had more like 400 people participating in the two days from basically all over the world. Every continent populated was represented by at least one person. So that, that made us extremely, extremely happy. The book, as you know, maybe noticed, it's it's a compilation. It's an edition of, of all the, of basically almost all the presentations that were given at the at the conference in 2019. And as such, let's say it's extremely different, difficult to to present because it's not that we can talk about the whole book 
um, you know, because it's the, 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 theme, the, the themes and the, and the different kinds of, of presentations were, were extremely, uh, you know, different from each other because it shows the wide range of, of thinking within the Austrian School of Economics and the wide range of topics that the Austrian uh, school interests itself in. So that, that I think it's great. That's why we basically asked uh, Adrian and, and Georgiana to give particular talks, you know, re related to the Austrian school, but it, it's not a presentation of the book because it, it, it would be impossible to, to make it. The book, by the way, is available at the Austrian Center's uh, website, austriancenter.com, also at, at Fundacion Bases website. You can download it for free in PDF format and if you're interested in keeping a very nice edition with hardcover, you can buy it uh, as well and we print it on, on demand. Two last things. I have a, a piece of news that I would like to share with you by the end of these uh, uh, remarks. But before that, please let me very briefly introduce our two speakers. We have Georgiana Constantin Park. She's originally from Romania but she's based in the US right now. She has a PhD in political science from the University of Bucharest in Romania. And she teaches uh, for the Liberty University's Helms School of Government. And by the way, she was one of the speakers at the, at the Austrian Economics Conference and she has spoken from the free, for the Free Market Roadshow uh, in, on several occasions as well. Adrian Rabier, He's an economist. He's a he's a PhD. Uh, he has a PhD in applied economics for uh, from the Universidad Rey Juan Carlos of, of Madrid. He's a very prolific author, and he has been. And I'm I'm sorry, I'm butchering both. You know, Adrian's and, and and Georgiana's CVs. You can you know, if you Google them, you can find a lot about them better than what I could say tell you now. But what I can what I would like to highlight about uh, Adrian who is also now, by the way, very much involved with ESEADE in Argentina, which is probably the leading Austrian economics uh, institution in South America. But nevertheless, he has always been a great friend and a great supporter of this conference. And in part, this conference reached, you know, jumped from Argentina to Austria in great part, thanks uh, to people like Adrian and many other uh, South American uh, and Latin American Austrian economic scholars who always uh, were very much uh, involved with every kind of event that helps to bring Austrian economics to more people and to, let's say, analyze and, and you know, and, and give a better perspective of our ideas. So in, in that regard, I'm, I'll always be thankful and I'm very happy that Adrian is here to, to give us a talk. Adrian will be talking about uh, the history of, Aust of the Austrian School of Economics, the, the five stages that he believes, you know, the Austrian School of Economics has, been, has gone through. And uh, Georgiana will give a talk uh, entitled Liberty of Language and Responsibility, which I think it's, it's very current. Both of them will speak for half an hour uh, each, each, and then at the end there will be some Q&A. Please feel free to leave your comments or questions both on the Zoom chat or at the um, Facebook uh, uh, chat in, uh, at the Austrian Economic Center where, where we, are broad, we are broadcasting this. And last but definitely uh, not least, I wanted to tell you all that very soon there will, there will be a new website for the Austrian uh, conference, which can be found, by the way, at austrianconference.org.org. And our intention, and we really want to do this, you know, we, we as Austrians, we believe in entrepreneurship, we believe in taking risks, and we believe in, in freedom, of course. We want to do the conference again in Vienna. It will be this fall. October, November 2021. We want to do it in person. We want to make an effort in order to do that. So please stay tuned, follow us on social media, be in contact with the Ocean Economic Center, be in contact with Fundacion Bases. And as soon as we have a date, we'll start promoting very, very heavily. And we really want to 
you know, to bring not, not only Austrian economics to Austria, but bring the world back to normal, at least what we can do, our world. So uh, we, 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 hope, we really hope we can do this uh, again in Austria in 2020, this year, in the fall of, uh, of Europe. So without further ado, Adrian, the, the floor is, your, is yours. You have 30 minutes. And then uh, I, I will come back and, and, and Georgiana will, will give us her talk. Thank you. Well, thank you, Federico, for this introduction. Thank you for everything that you do for this tradition of ideas. Um, I would like to congratulate you all because this conference in, in Vienna was a big opportunity for me to visit for the first time the city of Vienna, to visit the University of Vienna, to meet a lot of scholars from Europe, from everywhere in, in Europe. Uh, and I think that this is the way that we can have a big tradition of ideas, uh, in, of Austrian ideas that are, are very important and, and well. I, I congratulate you, you all because I think it's a very big effort. Well, I would like to talk about um, the five stages of, of the history of the Austrian School of Economics. Maybe before the first stage, we have to talk about the roots of ideas that, that make possible this tradition of ideas. We can start, for, for example, for, with Aristoteles, in, where, where he defends private property. We can remember the pre-Socratic authors also that defend some free market ideas. We can remember the, the laissez-faire ideas, especially in France with Quesnea Turgot. We can remember Richard Cantillon with, with his essay that Stanley Shevon said that this was the first book, the, the first treatise on economics that is very important for the Austrian ideas. We can remember also the scholastics and the, especially the, the school of Salamanca, where we find some authors as Juan de Lugo, Juan de Mariana, eh, Sarabia de la Calle. They are very important authors in the scholastics ideas. We can remember also the, the classical ideas, the classical economics like eh, Adam Smith, Adam Ferguson and David Hume. They are the Scottish authors and also some classical authors as uh, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, Jean Baptiste Say. I think that they are very, very important for, for the history of, of our tradition. Maybe we, we know that, that there is a debate in the Austrian school between uh, Murray Rothbard, for example, that think that classical ideas are wrong ideas and that they are not important for the Austrian tra tradition and maybe Mises and Hayek that have good things to say about Adam Smith and the classical economics. For me, in my view, Austrian economics is a con maybe is, is the continue of these classical ideas. And I think that these roots and the Scottish in particular with the spontaneous order are very, very important for our tradition of economic thought. Well, if we talk about these five stages of the Austrian school history, I think that the, the first one, very important, is the foundation, the foundation stage, where Karl Menger uh, wrote his Principles of Economics in 1871. This is a very important year, and I think that this event is very, very important, and the opportunity to return to Menger 150 years uh, ago, uh, this year in 2021, there is uh, exactly 150 years from the, the first book and the origin of the Austrian School of Economics. And this, I think, is very, very important to remark. Well, Menger, in this book, Principles of, of, of Political Economy, uh, he has a very important debate with, uh, that is called the Methoden Strait. And it's a debate of met methodological ideas where Menger uh, critique the, the historical, uh, the German historical thinking. Uh, Menger explained that Gustav Schmoller and his colleagues were wrong when they thought that the goal of economics should be to look for some regularities in history and not to develop uh, praxeological ideas or, or um, 
maybe some theory or some uh, pure theory uh, that is not exactly empirical. It's, it's a very important issue in the Austrian tradition. And I think that Menger, in this book that he wrote in 1883, again, uh, that compiled some articles of method methodological thinking, he has developed the structure that then uh, authors like Eugene von Baber, Mises, and Hayek, and others develop different ideas that complete the building of economic ideas that the Austrian economics have today. But I think that the first step was very important by Menger with the methodological uh, ideas. In this uh, book, Principles of Economics of 1871, Menger starts uh, to develop his capital theory and also explain that the goal of, of economics should be to develop laws uh, that make possible the theory, the pure theory of economics. And, and this is very important. Also, Menger was part of the revolutionary, the, the marginal revolution, where we have uh, with Menger, Stin, uh, William Stanley Jevons, and also Leon Walras. They, the, the three authors developed the, the marginal utility law that in a sense was a big debate with classical economics. Uh, Rothbard is, is right when he says that the, the, the objective value theory of, of the classical economists is wrong. Uh, and, and Menger was very important to develop this utility, marginal utility law as part of the, of the economic thinking. Uh, but most of the ideas of the classical economists were very important, and I think that it's very important to, to, to take as, as part of the good theory of economics. Well, if we start, Menger, I think, was, was very important with these two uh, important topics. The first was, as I say, the utility, the marginal utility law, and also the... Um, the, the, the topics of, of methodology that are very important. Well, Eugene von Baber uh, is the other author that, that shared with Menger the, this, this first stage of the foundation of economics. Eugene von Baber was uh, the student of Menger in a sense. He read the book that Menger wrote, and in that moment, he decided to destine all his life to the economic theory to develop economic theory. And, and he was professor in the University of, of Vienna also. And he wrote his book, Capital and Interest. It's a book in three volumes where he critiqued also Marx. And he also developed a very important uh, contributions to capital theory. This is a very important topic even today. And we have still debates with other school of thoughts on, on capital theory. Well, the, the third author that we might uh, mention is uh, von Wieser. He has a very important theory of imputation where we can see that the, the, the economic value or, 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 or the, 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 um, the prices of the products are not the sum of, of costs that is... Uh, instead that the, the prices of products define the costs of, of the products. This is a very important theory also, even in, the, in this debate we have with classical economics. And even today, it's a theory that, that we have to insist and, and develop because it's a big contribution of Austrian economics. So he, maybe in, in this first stage of, of the Austrian tradition history, I think that Menger, von Baber, and Wieser are very important authors. The second stage is the consolidation uh, stage because we have Mrs. and Hayek with big contributions, with very important debates, with Keynesian economics, with uh, capital theory, with, with uh, uh, Frank Knight and, and Clark. We also have the debate with socialism and are very important. Maybe the first uh, book that, that Mises wrote, The Theory of Money and Credit, was very important because in that book, he developed the Austrian business cycle theory. 
Mises eh, took the monetary theory of David Ricardo. He connect this theory with the interest rate theory, the natural interest rate theory of um, Bixel, Kenneth Bixel, and also with the capital theory that I mentioned before by Von Babert. David Ricardo, Bixel, and Von Babert were very important for the development of the Austrian business cycle theory by Mises. This theory was very important and Hayek understand that. Uh, Hayek participated the, in, the, um, in the seminar that Mises has had in, in the University of Vienna. And that was very important too for the development of the school of economics thought of the Austrian tradition because Uh, when Mises developed this seminar, it was not Menger alone, it was not von Baberg alone, it was not Mises and Hayek alone, there was a school of thought. We have some authors that participate in this, um, in this seminar and they developed the economic thinking and, and this was very important for the tradition. Well, Mises wrote several books in, in 1922, he developed, uh, he wrote his book Socialism, Before, in 1920, he has written an, an article, a short article, where he wrote the, the very important idea against social, socialism. But in this book of 1922, he developed in 400 pages a very uh, important contribution against socialism. And I think that that is very, very important. Well, we can see in this uh, book, that Mises explained his theory against socialism, which is his, this, this theory. Well, he explained that if, if we have property rights, then we can have markets. If we have markets, then we can have prices. If we have prices, then the entrepreneurs can develop the economic calculation. If we have economic calculation, then we can uh, understand if our projects have benefits or losses. And then if we have this, we can understand that, uh, that, that if we have benefits, we can continue this project. If we have losses, we have to stop with that project or, or change the way we are developing this project. But this is a way, in a way, is a, they are signals that are saying what we can do as entrepreneurs. We can continue with this project or we, can, we have to stop this project. Well. The thing that, that Mrs. Uh, understand and understood and that he explained to, to the socialist economists of his time is, is that Marx explained that he want uh, to eliminate the property rights of, of the economic goods. So if we don't have a property rights, then we don't have markets. In socialism, we don't have markets. We, if we don't have markets, then we don't have prices. If we don't have prices, then we cannot make economic calculation. If we don't have economic calculation, we can't know, we cannot know if we have benefits or losses in our projects. And if we don't have both, then what can we do? We, how can we know if we have to continue with this project or, or we have to stop the project? We don't know. That is why when we see different types of socialism apply in economic history, we see big problems. We, we see uh, that, that we have big poverty. We don't have the way to know how to assign the resources. And this is a very, very important contribution of, of Mises. Jesus Huerta de Soto, he was my director of my PhD dissertation in, in Spain. He said that this is the topic that make uh, That, that the school of, of, of the Austrian School of Economics um, have a very important uh, place in, in economic thinking because it's the school of thought that um, show why socialism is impossible. It's theoretical, theoretically impossible. And this is a very important contribution. Mises continued writing very important books. In 1927, he wrote a book called or the title was uh, Liberalism. Then he wrote a critique to interventionism. He wrote a book on, on bureaucracy. 
1944, this is a very important book because in a way we can understand that Mises um, advanced some topics of public choice of, of Jane Pugan and Gordon Tullock, Jeffrey Brennan. We can see also in 1949, the book uh, Human Action, his, his treatise on economics, a very, very important book for the Austrian tradition. Later in 1958, he wrote his book Theory and History of Economics, very important book on methodology, on where he returned to, to work on some topics of, of methodology. And we can continue. There are very important books of, by Mises in this second stage. We also have Hayek uh, in, as, a, as a student of Mises. Uh, but before uh, introducing uh, Hayek, we can make, maybe we can say a word about Joseph Schumpeter. Schumpeter also was a student of, of, of von Baber. Uh, I think his book on the theory of development economics of 1911 was a, a very important book, a, a very important Austrian book. There he talked about innovation, he talked about the theory of the entrepreneur, uh, he talks about uh, an economic dynamics that, are, that is very, very important. But later, Schumpeter makes some, receives some influences of Leon Walras, of Marx, by Keynes also. And he's a very important author, but the, the Austrian School of Economics sees Schumpeter as an author that is, in a sense, out of the school. And this is why he has a, a big different uh, influentials, not only Austrian, and, and that is why some things that Miss that Schumpeter developed may be Austrian and some don't. Well, if we go to Hayek now, Hayek was participating in the debate of, of Mises in Vienna. He was very important because he continued the work that, that Mises started. When we talk about the Austrian School of Economy, the Austrian theory of, of economic cycles, Hayek um, go, he, he went deeply on economic, uh, on, on the capital theory. Uh, he introduced several topics that contribute to understand better what, the, what Mises want to say about the, the Austrian business cycle theory. That's why we talk about the Mises Hayek economic cycle theory. And this is, I think, the, the best way to understand this contribution. Hayek wrote several books also. Uh, we can start maybe, he has several, several articles, very important articles in the 20s, but his first book, important book, was Prices and Production of 1931. Uh, this book was part of the debate he has with Keynes. I, I will talk about this in some minutes. Then he has a book on business cycles in 1933. Then he wrote in 1939 the book uh, Profits, Interest and Investment. In 1941, he wrote The Pure Theory of Capital. In 1944, he wrote uh, Camino de Servidumbre in Spanish, uh, The Road to Serfdom. Then he wrote uh, his book Law, Legislation and Liberty in 1973, 76, and 79. Before that, he wrote a book on psychology. He wrote a book on the Constitution of Liberty uh, in Spanish, Fundamentos para la Libertad. He wrote at, at the end in 1988, his last book, uh, uh, The Fatal Concept, La Fatal Arrogancia. It's a, a very important book also. He has other contribution also, but it is very important to see how Hayek starts working on economics, but later he introduced important contributions on, um, on, on political sciences, on the history of economic thought topic, he contributed also on, on law. He contributed on anthropological thinking. He's a, on psychology also. He's a very, very important in several topics of ideas. 10 minutes, Adrian. Uh, 10 minutes, okay. Well, I think that this second uh, stage, the consolidation uh, debate is very important because Hayek was uh, debating with Keynes uh, Hayek was very young. He was only 32 years old. when He went to London School of Economics, invited uh, by, by Lionel Robbins. In 1931, 
uh, Hayek has this debate with Keynes and all Cambridge. And at the beginning, he was, he has convinced the, the, the London School of Economics about the Austrian ideas. Uh, and this was very important in 1931. Later in 1936, as, as we all know, Keynes uh, published his book, um, The General Theory. And with this book, the, we, we have a big revolution that was not good for the, the Austrian ideas. There are th three, four arguments maybe that explain why the Austrian School of Economics in 1945, more or less, um, finish this second stage and start a, a third one where we have seen uh, the end in, in a sense of the Austrian tradition. What, what happened in that moment in, in between 1945 and 1970s? We have, we see, we, we, in a sense, we said that this third stage is the, the, the we, we can see Mises working alone, we can see Hayek working alone, as I say, with very important books, but we don't have a school. Why? Well, firstly, because we have a revolution in ideas where all the economic academy defend, in a sense, interventionism. So we see problems for free market economics. Secondly, we see that most of the books of the Austrian ideas were written in German. And now the, the economic language was English. So Mises and Hayek start again to write their books in, in English. So this, this deserves some, some time. And also we have the Nazis that uh, attack the, the Jewish. In, uh, and, and so they, they, they want to kill Mises and, they, and Mises have to go to, to Ginebra and then he, he, he take a, a vote to, to United States and finish in the, in the New York University. And Hayek went to England and then he went to also to the United States where he was received by, by the University of Chicago in, in the political sciences school. And we can see then uh, that in these 30 years between the 40s and the 70s, we have very good effort, very important efforts as Mrs. and Hayek, as I say, but we don't have a school of thought because Vienna was in the middle of the, the second, well, we, they were attacked by the, by the Nazis and, and all that. Well, in the 70s, we have a very important, this is a four, the fourth stage in the 70s, we have a very important seminar by, by, organized by the Institute for Human Studies in, in 1973. And there were th three economists invited for, for that conference. The, the first one was Murray Rothbard, that he participated in the seminar that Mises developed again now in the University of New York. Then we have a Ludwig Lachmann, that is an author very important that have connections with Hayek in the 30s. And finally, we have Israel Kirchner, that he made his, his PhD in economics in the University of New York with, a, with Mises as his director. In the 70s, we see that we have again new authors, very important authors. In 1974, Hayek received the Nobel Prize. This is, was very important for the Austrian School of Ideas. In 1973, Mises uh, abandoned. He, was, he died in 1973, and this was a big loss uh, for, for Austrian economics. But well, in, I think that in the 70s, uh, Keynesian economics entered in a stage of, of problems. They, they couldn't explain why we have inflation. They couldn't explain why we have stagflation. We have seen a, a lot of countries with problems that Hayek anticipated in the 30s. When Hayek studied, in, even I, I don't mention before, but there is a very important book by Hayek in two volumes, his studies and his new studies in economics, philosophy, history of economic thought and, and else. And we can see what a, a campaign of Hayek against Keynesianism. Uh, and we can see how uh, Hayek destroy, in a sense, uh, Keynesianism, Keynesianism and explains that the problems that we will have in the future. 
Hayek recognized that if we have, that, that maybe he thought that the problems will, will come before, uh, but Keynesianism dominated economic thinking for 40 years. When, when finally in the 70s or at the end of the 60s, we start seeing that we have problems, uh, well, the economic uh, academy accepts that Hayek anticipate most of, of that problems. In the 70s, we also have the monetarist contra-revolution. Milton Friedman uh, returned to the ideas of Irving Fisher, and that was very important to explain that the inflation has a monetary origin. I think that the monetarist economics and Austrian economics can be friends in this, in this idea. But there are some differences between Friedman and Hayek, and they have important debates on, on these topics also. Uh, and, and this is maybe the last stage, the fifth stage. Between the, two, the, the two, two thousands and until today, we can see that we have rational expectations like by Lucas, Sargent, uh, Kidlan and Prescott and, and other economic uh, authors that are very important. But Hayek would say they are wrong. They are wrong because they don't see that the economics uh, have to go through another uh, way. And we can see, for example, there that I, I, I give big value to, to Ludwig Lachmann, where he developed a book on the structure of production. He connects the capital theory with subjective expectations, with the non-neutrality of money, with the capital theory, with the Austrian business cycle theory. There are a new macro there that is very, very important. In, in my own dissertation, and I present this dissertation in Vienna, and it's part of this book that Federico presented some minutes ago, uh, I develop a positive slope for the Phillips curve and explain why Friedman is wrong, Lucas is wrong, Kidland and Prescott are wrong, and, and the new classical economics is wrong. I think that we have to see uh, and the Austrian tradition as a, a very important school of thought today. We have debates, a, a big debate developed today. We can see, for example, that in the times of Mises and Hayek, they both wrote about many topics. They make contributions to economics, to economic thought uh, contributions. They, they make contributions to methodological topics, to macroeconomic theory, to monetary theory to international economic theory. We have big topics that we have big contributions, but today we have an Austrian school of economics that have many specialist economists in many topics. So if we want macro, we have Roger Garrison. He wrote a book called Time and Money. It's very important. If we want micro foundations, we can uh, go to Stephen Horwitz. He is very important author. If we want to study the transition of the East Europe to capitalism, then we can see the contribution of Peter Betke. If we want to study anarchy, we can study Peter Leeson. If we want history of economics, we can go to Robert Higgs. If we want the theory of the film, we can see Peter Klein, Nikolai Foss. They are very important authors. If we want methodology, we can go to Gabriel Zanotti. He is a very important Argentinian author in Austrian economics and others also. So we can see today that the new Austrian economics have very important contributions to show to the academy in many topics. And I think that this is very, very important for our times. I think that uh, every economist and every people that are interested in, in in social sciences should know what the Austrian economists have to say. Well, I think that this, I, I don't have more time. So thank you, Federico, for this opportunity to talk about the Austrian economics. Uh, and, and thank you again for giving me the opportunity to visit Vienna, to visit the University of Vienna, again, to meet all these very important scholars that we have in Europe. And I think that this bridge that we have between Latin America and Europe will 
produce some new articles with co-authors and and many contributions that are very, very important for for our tradition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Um, Adrian, well, he's, he's, he's in, in Argentina right now. It's the peak of summer, so he has interrupted his holidays to be with us. So we're, we're very happy and thankful. He'll, you know, if internet allows it, he'll remain until the end, and then we'll have some time to, to ask him some, some questions. As Adrian highlighted at, at the very end, uh, the, one of the big you know objectives that the conference you know proposes to itself is to to be a form or be a good vehicle for for networking for it's great one of the the best things that can happen after the conference is that people who meet there start new projects you know things that maybe have nothing to do with the conference you know but things that happen you know that it's a catalyzer for for new projects to happen so One of the things we were thinking, by the way, for 2021, for this year, hopefully that we'll be able to do the conferences, we're going to prioritize as much as we can instances in which people can network. So, you know, we want to bring, that is something that in 2020 has been completely lost because uh, online events are limited and that we really want to, to prioritize. But without further delay, I'll give the floor now to Georgiana. Georgiana is a great speaker, a very passionate speaker. We're very happy and honored to have her. Her, her contribution, by the way, to the conference and to the book is one of the highlights, definitely. So I'm, I'm really curious for what she has to say about, about liberty of, of uh, uh, you know, both regarding responsibility and language. Georgiana, you have 30 minutes and then we'll have some time for, for Q&A. The floor is yours. Thank you, Federico. And, um, thank you for that uh, generous description. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen over here because I do have a little PowerPoint um, that might help the story along a little bit. Georgiana, your, your volume is, is, is a little bit low. Okay, I'm going to put my face closer to my computer and see how that works. Is that, that better? It works. That <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> let me know. Let me know if I start fading out because I can't tell. Um, all right. So can you see the PowerPoint that I have here? Yes. Perfect. All right. Let me start this little slideshow. And I have your faces on the side. Okay. So um, I thought it was interesting when Adrian actually mentioned that the um, language of the time for economics was English. And it was no longer German and people had to start writing in English so that they could reach a, a better audience. So what a good transition to, to what I'm about to talk about, uh, which is the, the importance of language in the context of freedom and the importance of responsibility in the context of language and freedom as well. Um, because if you're going to be free, you have to be, you have to use that freedom responsibly, <clears throat> or at least you should. So I want to start out talking a little bit about what is, what is language in general? We have the regular definition, the words, their pronunciation, the methods of combining them used and understood by a community. Of course, language is a lot more than that. It's not just words. We already know that there's such a thing as um, body language. And, um, and some languages, um, I heard about a language in Greece that is only uh, whistles. So it's, it's more sound than anything else. But in general, when we talk about language, we talk about words um, and the way that we say them um, and, and all of those things. Um, now, language doesn't simply help inform and communicate. It, when you think about it, when you close your eyes and, and you hear the words, it was a sunny afternoon and the birds were chirping. You can imagine that. So that creates images in your head, um, but it also helps you shape the reality around you. It helps you understand it, get its essence. It helps you think, it helps you create. It, it is a very, very complex phenomenon. Um, and there are countries, as we know, uh, such as the US, who have a beautiful protection of people's um, freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Um, and we know it was born out of the desire to keep the invasive government forces out of people's lives. Um, Unfortunately, such, such oppression is, is still present to this day in many parts of the world. But um, I've seen here in the US the, uh, the, the, the good things that have come out of this protection of free speech. And I've seen some problems with it as well since I've moved over here. 
Um, so the essence of language, um, if we were to put it in a, in one word, it's the word, right? This is something that defines us as a species. As far as we know, humans are the only ones um, who use words. And um, you can see these in millennial rituals that we had, magic rituals um, before Christianity, where we used all, uh, all of these words that are supposed to have certain powers. But even in the story of Christianity, and it's the religion I'm talking about because it's the one I know since I'm a Christian myself, um, even there we have so much that has to do with the word. In fact, our God is the word. We call him God the word. Uh, in biblical Christianity. And I wanted to just stop a little bit. All of this is going to make sense in a little bit why I'm talking about all of this. Um, kind of rest a little bit on the story of Adam's creation. And whether one is religious or not doesn't matter because this story has historical meaning as much as it does theological meaning. So after Adam was created, he had to name everything. He had to give a name to everything he saw. Well, what does that mean? It, it means that he had to understand what he sees and describe the essence of what he sees in one word. And we know from earlier in, in, in Genesis that the word also creates, and again, that the word is God. So what a wonderful tribute to the um, profound um, essence of what the word, in fact, is and what it can do. Um, Again, whether one is religious or not, looking at a story like this, Adam was created and then he had to what? He had to understand his environment. And how does he prove that he's understanding it? Through words. Now, from a secular perspective, we know that feelings can change according to the words that we use. Of course, if we wake up saying, oh, what a horrible, horrible morning. I'm not going to get anything done. It's going to be terrible. All of these words are going to have an effect on us. Uh, but if we wake up and even though we don't feel like it, we at least try to say, well, I think it'll be a good morning. Maybe those words will have an effect and, and, and help us kind of get through the day a little bit. Um, one fascinating thing I found was that babies can actually tell the difference uh, from the womb. So before they're born, um, between their own language and a foreign language. So they have the music of their own language from the moment uh, before they're, in fact, before they're born. Um, and I think this is just a testament to how important this means of communication um, is to people. In fact, my niece, who's two years old now, when she was first born, she was a few months old, I was holding her, and I was speaking to her in English. She's, she's American. Um, and she was just going about her little, cute little things that she was doing. But the moment I switched to my native language, to Romanian, she froze. She didn't know what to do it, with these weird sounds coming out of my mouth that didn't make any sense to her. Was it something threatening? Had something changed in her environment? What was going on? I thought that was such a fascinating experience to notice how this little two-month-old was reacting to a difference in language, a language she had never heard. So I have here a little example. And this is a poem um, that you might recognize, especially because we have a lot of um, Spanish speakers today. I may not have chosen this very well, but <laughs> we'll get there. Um, so it's a poem that um, I'm actually going to reveal um, in the second part when I show it in its original language. But here it is in English, right? It's, it's a little, little part of it. Um, and here it's how it, it just creates these images. I am a traveler to all parts and a newcomer to none. I am art among the arts. With the mountains I am one. I know how to name and class all the strange flowers that grow. I know every blade of grass, fatal lie, and sublime woe. I have seen through dead of night upon my head softly fall, rays formed of the purest light from beauty celestial. I think we can all appreciate this is a beautiful poem, translated in English, sounds great, is lovely. Well, let's move on to the original version. And this is probably the part where many of you might recognize that this is a um, poem by Jose Martí. And this is the Spanish version. And for all you Spanish speakers out there, tell me if there is a difference in the way that you perceive what I'm about to pronounce right now. Yo vengo de todas partes. Yes, ya todas partes voy. Arte soy entre las artes. En los montes, montes soy. 
Yo sé los nombres extraños de las hierbas y las flores y de mortales engaños y de sublimes dolores. Yo he visto en la noche oscura llover sobre mi cabeza los rayos de lumbre pura de la divina belleza. Now, some of you might have liked the way I said that. This might have vibrated with you because this is your, your native language and you might have said, ah, yes, it sounds so much better in Spanish. Or you might have said, Ugh, I'm not sure I like your accent. Not, that's not how you read this poem. Um, I'm going to go on out of limb and say that my Spanish version and the way that I read it had more of an effect on you than the English version. Because while you speak English as a second language, and I do too, usually, and for me as well, the effect is, yes, I understand this. Yes, this is beautiful. But when you move to my, my own language, I have things to say. And there are things that vibrate within my heart that are very, very different um, than in another language. It would be interesting uh, for somebody who speaks, who's bilingual from birth. That, that would be a fascinating thing to study. And it is being studied right now. So the point of all of this was to show that the word is not just powerful. It is subtle. It is complex. And as of yet, we don't really understand the fullness of its effects um, on us. So the question is, especially for now, the 21st century and after 2020, this crazy year, who is to wield this power of the word? Who is to be its master? And we have um, several answers here. You could say, well, the individual, obviously. Other people will say, mm, no, the state. The state should have the ultimate power to decide how we speak and how we do things. Other people might say local or ideological communities or the international community. We've seen the UN try to introduce many types of different language as well. So which is the answer that is most conducive to freedom? So freedom of the word, again, is freedom of identity. It's freedom to create, to imagine, to think. And of course, who else should be in charge of this other than the individual? Now, that's not to say that the individual always uses it right. Of course, we have to be responsible in our use of words. I mean, there are so many things we could do. We can harm each other by things that we can say. We can incite riots and violence and horrible things. We can bully each other. It, it can be. Um, something that we don't necessarily know how to use. However, what happens when this extremely powerful weapon is wielded primarily by the ideology of a state? And this is such a current conversation. Uh, you might have heard about Amazon kicking Parler off of its servers. You might have heard about Facebook and Twitter banning Donald Trump's speech. Um, you might have heard about you definitely have heard about that, the, the problems with monopolies over here in America where people say, well, these companies have gotten way too big and they need to be broken apart. Um, all of this ignoring the fact that the reason that there's a monopoly of these great companies is because they come out like Facebook and say, well, we want to be more regulated. And of course, when you regulate a big company, there's no room for the little company to come in and break through the market and compete against the big one. The more regulation, the more money the little guy needs to actually get in there. So the real problem with these monopolies is the barrier to entry in the market. So some can say, well, since the government, there's like kind of one hand washes the other, since the government, these companies are kind of together, is it the companies that's banning the speech or is it really the government acting indirectly? I'm not gonna get into that because that's not the point, but you can see how current this problem is nowadays. Um, and we have in, in the US um, Congress right now, for instance, Nancy Pelosi, um, she has these rules where she wants to change uh, pronouns and familial relationships in the house uh, to gender neutral words. So when she came out and identified as a mother and a wife and a daughter, a lot of people said, well, I thought you said we we're using gender neutral pronouns. What are you doing? Um, there's a Democratic congressman that came out and it was, it was kind of funny. He came out and after saying a prayer, um, he ended it with a man and then he added a woman. And of course, you know, it, it was ridiculous, but it was also a little dangerous because, you know, he came out and said, well, it was a joke. The critics shouldn't have attacked me the way that they did. 
Um, of course, people were a little revolted around the fact that he didn't understand the linguistic uh, origin of the word amen, which is uh, let it be or so be it, uh, which comes from Hebrew and then moved on into Latin. It's not a gendered word. Um, whether that was a joke or not isn't really relevant here. It's about the conversation that we're having where now we're looking at language as something that has to be changed in order not to offend. Uh, you have um, in, in, in New York, you have employers that can get fined for using the wrong gender pronoun. And again, it doesn't matter which side of the barricade you're on here. Um, the California bill, which proposes the government get involved in stopping the misgendering of people who live in, in old people's homes. But no matter what side you're on, no matter if you think that you should have all of these people calling you whatever you wanna be called, or whether you think maybe, no, they shouldn't be called that because uh, I'm not gonna play that game. It doesn't matter what you think. The point is, instead of leaving the freedom of language up to the individual, instead of people choosing their friends and saying, well, you're not respectful to me, so I don't wanna be your friend anymore. I don't wanna do business with you. Now you're introducing the government, you're introducing the state into the conversation. And instead of you and the other individual maybe talking it through or ending a relationship that doesn't work, now you can go to the state and you can say, you gotta help me out here because this person isn't doing what I want them to do. And then that person can get fined or Lord forbid imprisoned. So where is this heading? Where are we going with this, this forced change of language? Um, and there was an article in the Washington Times that I thought was just made a lot of sense when they said that punishing speech is the most dangerous business because there will be no end. The remedy for hateful or threatening speech is not silence or punishment. It is more speech, speech that challenges the speaker. So we know that freedom of speech is protected in the United States, but the only freedom of speech that is protected is the one that is political. Um, and the government is the one who's not supposed to limit your freedom of speech. Private companies can do that, which is why the conversation about Facebook and all those other companies is, is very complicated. So private companies can say, I don't like what you have to say. This is not what our internal rules are. And, uh, you know, we don't want you talking that way. And, and you can risk your job, perhaps, if you say the wrong thing. Of course, generally, you're free to go and find another job. Um, but when the government gets involved, then it becomes dangerous. This very, very delicate balance of the social contract is going to start to go in a direction that we don't want it to go. It doesn't matter if you're allowed to say as a company, well, you shouldn't be talking. The real question is, should you really say that? Should that really be your business? What people say? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's just that an alarm that I think needs to be rang at this point in time, because you're turning a relationship between individuals um, into a subject of state intervention. And once you've done that, there's no going back. Um, so what happens when reality is shaped by the government? When there is no freedom of perception or thought. What happens when this now cliche saying goes, um, that Orwell is no longer fiction. And we know what happens, we've been there. I come from Eastern Europe and, and we've had these issues, although I have to say, we were really never banned to say certain words. It was generally ideas that were not supposed to be uttered, certain types of ideas. Now it's become so subtle, it's become so detailed that it's no longer just the ideas. Now it's the words themselves. It doesn't even matter what's behind them. Well, now we're redefining language and we're finding weirder and newer ways to constrict the way that people think. So unfortunately, I don't think and it's an exaggeration to say that if the government can tell you what to say, what and how to think, uh, that re reality is subjective and you don't, um, if you don't see it that way, then you're gonna be fined or ridiculed or put in jail then you're not talking about a free society anymore. Now you're talking about an oppressive society. If the government can say these things, where is your freedom? What's left? So back to the word, the most powerful force for freedom, but also the most powerful weapon. 
I think it should be within the control of the individual. Of course, we have laws against inciting riots and doing all these horrible things. And of course, there's a delicate balance there. But again, how much are you willing to give to the government in terms of power over your words? And we have to encourage each other to use this responsibly. I don't think that the state needs to get involved in this. Because like I said, once it does, there's no way that it's going to be going back, that it's going to be leaving you alone. So language is something that develops organically. It can't be forced and it can't be faked. Sorry about my phone. Um, we had something in communist Romania that we used to refer to, and we still actually have some of that left over, as wooden speech. And what this was, was an agglomeration of words, of fancy sounding, empty of meaning words that you put together and you delivered a very short and weak message, but it sounded grandiose and it sounded meaningful. Like you were really, really saying something. You would look at those people and say, wow, that, wow, that sounds really smart. I'm not really sure what he's saying, but I guess if I don't understand, uh, it, it means it's a smart thing that he's saying. Um, and we can see this today naturally evolving in language where we're picking up a lot of uh, English words and putting it into language, but that's something that occurs naturally. When you see the state kind of forcing these type of expressions on people, nobody would take them seriously in Romania. It was the, the middle of the communist regime and everybody was making fun of this speech. There was so much humor related to this. There were so many jokes because everybody felt that it was fake and that it was there to, um, it, it just the feeling that you get, it was there to limit your thinking. In fact, it led to something that I refer to as template thinking. Uh, if it's not within a template, I, I can't picture it. If you really follow that type of speech, you will not be open-minded. You will think within a box, talk about think outside and inside the box. Um, so attempting to control people's words, it's a declaration of intent to control them in the most intimate degrees. Um, as all of these dy dystopian books that we may read of fiction um, have really shown us, but at the same time as, as oppressive societies have shown us themselves. Communism in, in Eastern Europe and in, in Russia and in China and with technology, it's only getting worse. It's only going to get worse. So the delicate balance of the social contract, it can't be maintained. If language continues to be the battleground, it has never worked in the past and it has been tried. And it's not gonna work now. It's gonna lead to instability and it's going to lead to a lot of people being upset. And again, the more you try to keep something away from people, the more the forbidden fruit mentality is going to come out and say, that's something that we want. Um, I think that vigilance, education, and responsibility are needed for people to be aware of their rights and to be able to hold on to them. I mean, what do we have left? if our words are being watched. And they are, make no mistake, we already know that. Um, in Romania, we have a saying to this day where you pick up the phone and you say, instead of hello, you say hello to you and all of our listeners. It was never a secret that there was propaganda and that you were being surveilled and that the state was what it was. People knew that. Now people seem very, very shocked that such things happen, especially around here in the United States. Um, most of the times I wonder why are they shocked because the more you give the state, the more it's going to impose its power upon you. So I think that now is a time for us to respectfully, legally, nicely, smartly fight for our rights when it comes to the freedom of the word, because if we lose the word, and I really doubt that that's ever going to happen, but if we do lose the word, then we've lost all of our essence. We've lost everything. There's no freedom left, no freedom of thought, no freedom of religion, especially for Christians, no freedom at all. So this might have been shorter. I'm not exactly sure 
how many minutes I had left, probably a few more, but this is pretty much it for me, guys. Thank you, Georgiana. Thank you very much. Um, I, I see Adrian is, is with us too. Um, uh, well, I, rem I remind everyone that they, they can uh, leave questions at the Q&A section or, or the chat. The, I received a couple of questions via private chat and I have a couple of my own. So I want to start with you, Georgiana. I want to, I mean, you mentioned something during your presentation, but I would like you to, uh, I would like to ask you, what do you think is the, is the role in the, sense, in, in the sense of this, let's say, censorship spirit? What do you think is the role of American academia and American universities in, you know, generating this spirit or not? That's a good question. And that's something that we're definitely witnessing nowadays where unfortunately most- If most you can come closer to the microphone, sorry. There, how's that? Is that better? Okay. Um, unfortunately in the US, the trend has been the other way around. It seems that there's a lot of censorship within great big universities, universities of repute. Um, I would love to see them be at the forefront of freedom of speech because if you go to a school and they present you with, with one option and they say, this is how you have to think, um, you're losing so much. And that's why I love the Austrian Economic Conference so much because there are all these people who come from different backgrounds and share all of these ideas. Um, and what they're interested in, in the end, is that idea, is the logic of it, is how you can apply it. And you don't really see this in academic discourse in the US anymore. In fact, people are, they're fearful to a point where if you write a paper at a, a certain university, I'm, I'm lucky enough to work for a university that's free in, in terms of speech, but um, for other places, and I've heard stories of my friends where they say, well, I had to write this paper, but my professor told me I have to keep it gender neutral. This is really difficult in the English language. Uh, I've never tried it in my own language, but in English, it's, <laughs> it's not easy. You gotta go back and you gotta, oh, it, it's a headache. Um, and then if we start saying things like a man and a woman and the word man, which is not gendered in that particular word now has to be taken out of there, there's no language left, it's nonsense. So I, I'd like to see these universities, you know, go out there and be brave and say, we need to be a place where there is free speech because there has to be free uh, thought. Otherwise, what, what are they doing? What are they teaching? But um, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen in the future? I don't know. Before moving to, to Adrian, a, a follow-up question. While I was uh, listening to you, the other thing that came to my mind was uh, what, what brought Jordan Peterson, you know, into, let's say, celebrity, which was a few years ago that I think a provincial Canadian government wanted to uh, basically not, you know, not forbid what should be said, but impose what should be said. And this is, I mean, I'm not an expert and you definitely know uh, more about this subject, but I think this is something that not even the communists try to do. They try to, let's say, tell you, okay, this should not be said, but not you have to say this or that. Exactly. That's a very good point. And that's why I was looking at the communist regime, at least in my country, where, again, there was that language that the government put out there for people to know about. Um, but nobody went to prison for not saying the proper word. That didn't happen. And even the jokes were allowed to a certain degree. Um, because as long as you did your thing and you, you, know, you didn't do anything actively against the government and you didn't uh, say, perpetuate the wrong ideas um, in terms of what could be a risk to the government, you were fine. But if you start now going to prison or getting a fine or getting the government involved in saying the wrong word, this is a level of detail of control that I have never heard of, except in those books of fiction that we talked about earlier. Thank you, Georgiana. And Adrian, you finished. This is a question I, I wanted to ask you, and, and, and then I'll ask you something that uh, was brought to me. Um, you finish your, your uh, presentation in a very generous way, mentioning all, let's say, some many, no, not all, sorry, many current uh, Austrians, um, you know, that are in different, let's say, areas or fields. And I think that was extremely useful. And what I wanted to ask you, like following up on that is, 
where do you think, which are, let's say, like the most cutting edge, the most, you know, vanguardia issues in the, in the Austrian school today, or, you know, some young new authors or, you know, certain topics that you say, you should pay attention to that? Well, I think that in, in macroeconomics, in, in monetary theory and monetary policy, uh, we have big contributions with the um, Austrian business cycle theory, with capital theory, with subjective expectations, with uh, non-neutrality of money. I have that we have big issues there that they are still of of the PhD in economics. If we have a big debate today with a PhD in economics, I think that they will not accept uh, or, or, or they didn't study the Austrian business cycle theory, the, cap the Austrian capital theory, the subjective expectations and the non-neutrality of money. And they are big issues. And it's very simple to explain this, but they are out of the, of the PhD program. Uh, and this is very worried for me. And we have very important macroeconomics as Roger Garrison, Larry White, um, George Selgin, Jesus Huerta de Soto in Spain, uh, Nicolás Kachanowski uh, is an Argentinian that is living now in, in Denver in the United States. He, he is a professor of macroeconomics. He completed his PhD in Boston uh, and he is uh, developing big contributions with, in co-author with Peter Lewin. Peter Lewin has a book that is uh, Capital in Disequilibrium. It's a big topic also. And I think that we, we have there many topics that are out of the business today and that, that are very important. Also because we, when we see this, poli this uh, monetary policy in the 2020, uh, we see that the Federal Reserve and the, the Central Bank of Europe and the Central Bank of China and Japan and every central bank, they are issuing money in levels that are not known in the history of economics. And we are creating big bubbles that maybe in the short term are helpful for, for stop the, the crisis maybe, but I think that in the long run, we are going to see the more deeply economic crisis that we have in, in the recent history. And it's a, a, a big issue. Also, the Austrian theory is, has a friend with the cryptocurrencies, with Bitcoin and all this. Maybe we can, we have, I think we have a, a, a good framework to, to understand what is happening with cryptocurrencies. Um, and this is an issue that many people is trying to understand. And I have the Austrian monetary theory is, is useful for this end. Uh, so me, me, that I, I, sh I should uh, say that maybe this is my view because my topic of interest is macroeconomics. Maybe if we talk with, with Robert Hicks, he can explain that that history of economics through an Austrian view is also very important because we can understand again what happened in the 1930s, what happened in the subprime crisis of 2008, what happened in many of the crises that we have in many countries. And I'm sure that economic history is very important. If we go to the topic of methodology, uh, I think that most of the economists today are not studying methodology. It's, it's out of the business again. And for Austrians, uh, the history of economic thought and the epistemology of economics are big issues. And if, if someone participated in our conferences, like in Rosario or Vienna, a methodology is also a big issue that, that should be studied, not, o not only by economists, also by the every person that is interested in, in social sciences in general. Yes, definitely. Thank you for that. And, and Adrian, a, a question that I, that I received via, via the chat. What, uh, what can you tell us as an Austrian economist and as an economist about modern monetary theory, MMT? 
Well, there is a book by Juan Ramón Rayo. There, there are some articles or, or posts in, in Punto de Vista Económico. We, with Nicolás Cachanoski, Gabriel Zanotti, Martín Krause, we have our own, own blog. Uh, is, there is a book by Israel Kirchner, The Economic Point of View. So we translate that to Spanish and we put punto de vista económico punto com, dot com. And in that blog, we have many material to, to study this topic. Uh, we are critic of this theory, but I think that we have a new conference. We need a new conference to study this, this issue and to, to offer some fundamentals against this theory. So maybe I, I would recommend to look for the Juan Ramón Rayo, he's a scholar from Spain, that very early uh, he wrote a book on the topic. When he did that, I was surprised because I didn't know about the theory and, and Juan Ramón wrote the book. <laughs> and I was learning about that. So I was, but he anticipated the big topic because now I, we can see many central banks talking about this theory that I think uh, they have the same mistakes as the Keynesian economics and, and they are going to have the same problems with inflationary episodes and, and bubbles and economic cycles uh, that, that are not helpful. And it's very important that the Austrians attack this type of, th of new theories. Uh, but but I, I would recommend this book by, by Juan Ramón Rayo. This book is in Spanish. And if you want some material in English, I'm sure that Lawrence White, uh, he's a professor of the George Mason University. Uh, I'm sure he, he has conferences and articles and videos in, in YouTube that may be helpful. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, let's say paraphrasing Karl Marx, who is not my favorite thinker, of course, we could say that, you know, MMT is the opium of central bankers. And, you know, this is going to be probably quite, quite dangerous. There's a question here. I think it's, it's for the two of you. I, I would refer it first to, um, to Georgiana. By, the, the question is by Ernst Schmidt. And the, the question is, how, how would you rate uh, the book of, of Hayek, the, the Road to Selfdom? Is the, if, if you think it, it fits our times. Yes, absolutely. I'm actually, I have it in here because I'm teaching a course on economics at the, um, the Liberty University as well. So I have it there and I was, I was looking through it and I have Can to say all of closer? these. <laughs> yes, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, I have to say that, that most of these books and especially this one, um, yes, it speaks to what we need to learn about, to what we need to understand and to what we need to be really, really careful um, about um, in, in our times, absolutely. All, and I think that uh, Hayek and all of the, the, the people that, that uh, Adrian was talking about earlier, they are so relevant. Um, you, they, they need to be understood and they need to be read because this, um, this, this, first of all, there's nothing new under the sun. It's not like human nature is gonna change overnight and we're going to become different types of creatures that are going to be completely unpredictable in history. That's not going to happen. People have generally the same tendencies. And, if, and we have to remember history and we have to remember what people have been through. We have to remember their observations um, and the things that they did that were useful in history. And, and all of these people, the Austrian thinkers, and especially this book you mentioned, I think these are very, very important. And yes, very current, I think so. And Georgiana, where, where do you think we can find, let's say, instances, places that, where, where we can find opportunities to defend freedom of speech? Because as, as you mentioned, you know, th there's definitely an assault against it. But also, let's say, to be a little bit optim or more optimistic and also because I think there are tools at, at our hands in order. Where, where do you think we should focus? I think it starts early. I think we should focus on education. Um, I think first in the family. So the, the people who believe in the ideas and ideals of freedom need to teach their children about the importance of it. Now, that's not to say that you teach your child to go out there and yell on the street and get themselves killed in a riot. That's not what I mean. I mean, they need to understand the importance of it from an intellectual perspective um, and maybe from a spiritual perspective. Um, they also need to be taught how to survive. So there's a time and place for everything. I've seen Facebook try to get people to talk about political things 
Um, and it, to me, it looked very communist. It looked almost like, do these people have spies? Are they trying to get stuff out of me that I'm not supposed to say? So you need to be, um, I guess to quote the Bible, and I hope I'm saying this right, is, is to be as harmless as doves, but as wise as serpents. So you have to go forward being smart about what you do, but you have to understand the importance of freedom and the ideals of it. And then you have to move to primary school, to secondary school. You raise a child, a person who understands these things. They might be a professor to somebody tomorrow who helps them on and on and on. So I guess the best way to do it is infiltrate the system, quote unquote, teach these people about freedom and put them in the right positions to keep the balance of government and individual um, there, to keep it there, to keep it stable. That's what I think. Thank you, Georgiana. And coming back to, to Adrian, Adrian, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the B word, Bitcoin. Well, you mentioned cryptocurrencies. I think Bitcoin is still over 30,000 by now. It has had a, a massive rally, I don't know, in the last eight, nine months. There are people who have, let's say, very wild predictions of what could happen uh, this year. And let's say, regardless of the, of the exchange rate with the dollar, what is what are cryptocurrencies telling us about what's going on with monetary policy with central banks and where do you see the future of money going well again i think this is another conference uh, but the first thing to say is that yes we have a rally in the last months but we have a rally from the beginning of bitcoin if we see in 2009, the price of Bitcoin, and we see now, we see that there's always, it is always going up. Maybe we have big, fluctu big fluctuations because we are learning about Bitcoin and people that learn maybe buy Bitcoin and, and, and make big investments. And we have this, uh, well, this, this price going up, going up, always going up. Uh, and now it, it takes to 40,000 and then come back to 30,000. But if we compare it each year, it is going, it is increasing every year. Um, I don't know what, what will happen in the future with Bitcoin. I think that we learned a lot with these cryptocurrencies that they are showing maybe a, a new monetary system that can... Uh, make some, how, how you say, uh, desafios? Um, challenges. Some challenges to the central banks, because when we see that the, 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 the quantity of, of Bitcoins is, uh, have a, big, a, a very important rule, we are going to have 21 million Bitcoins in 20, 2033 in 2033, uh, then uh, we are going to see that there are no more Bitcoins uh, created. Uh, so we can see if, if we continue having central banks printing money and, and the Bitcoin is steady, then we can imagine that the price of, of Bitcoins in, with exchange rates with dollars and any other money we are go or currency. We are going to see that that Bitcoin is is going up. In the future, maybe there is a new cryptocurrency with a better rule, with a better system that is more more secure, that is better in a, in many sense. And maybe this new money of the future will replace Bitcoin. It's one a scenario. It's it's, it's maybe it can it can happen. Um, but I think that we are learning how to recover some money that is not monopolized by, by governments. And, and, and this is very important because we can uh, have a new limit, the new limit for the, for the government, uh, limit for the states. For the, if, if we compare, if we study how governments have been increasing they, uh, well, in, in all the, the last century, there maybe, you know, I don't know, in, b before the, the First World War, uh, the government was less than 10% one, one of, of GDP. And now it's near 30, 40, 50, and in some countries, 
60% of GDP. So how, we, how can we stop this government that advance against our liberties, individual liberties, individual freedom, our, the, the responsibility of this, that is associated with this freedom? How can we recover free markets? When we have to stop governments, and, and the way maybe yes, is to, to recover money, a currency that is not in the hands of the state. And, and, and then is there a, a big contribution of cryptocurrencies that can help us to recover free market economics. Thank you for 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 uh, for the, to both of you for for your time. Thanks to thanks to Victoria, who is by the way, one of the the the, the keys that this book uh, came to life. Uh, Victoria Schmidt from from the Austrian Economic Center. And speaking of the book, Victoria posted the link where you can find di directly download it or buy the the physical copy. And Keep related, please, with the Austrian Economic Center, with Fundación Bases, and you know we'll we'll inform you of, of future events like this, and of the tenth Austrian Economics Conference that will happen, hopefully, in Vienna by the end of this year. Thanks to all of you, and hope I see you soon in some of these events.